Welcome to Abraham Out of One Many, an engaging art exhibition brought to you by Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston and curated by Caravan, an international arts NGO nonprofit that is recognized as a leader in using the arts to further our global quest for a more harmonious future, both with each other and with the earth. Interfaith Ministries is Houston's oldest service organization. Dialogue, collaboration, and service have been at the heart of our work for over 50 years. Our programs fall into four areas. We are Texas's largest Meals on Wheels program covering six counties, but primarily in Harris and Galveston counties. We're one of the top 10 largest Meals on Wheels programs in the country. We also have a strong Refugee Services Resettlement Program working with Episcopal Migration Ministries to help resettle refugees into the Houston area. Volunteer Houston connects individuals, groups, and companies with nonprofit agencies to transform the greater Houston community for good through volunteerism. And interfaith relations and community partnerships fosters understanding, respect, and engagement among people of all faiths. IRCP is thrilled to be able to host this exhibit. Please visit www.imgh.org to learn more about us. Between April 20th and May 21st, we hosted Abraham out of one many, virtual exhibit of 15 paintings by three celebrated artists from the Middle East. We had planned to host these paintings in person in our Brigitte and Bashar Kalai Plaza of Respect and Great Hall in April of 2020, but COVID derailed those plans. We were thrilled to work with Caravan to create a virtual gallery experience so that we were able to reschedule the exhibit. A virtual experience allowed for a wide variety of accessible programs, including the program you're about to enjoy. We are grateful to the sponsors that made this event possible, especially our lead donors, Joni and David Andrews, Debbie and Floyd Kearns, Marion and Paul Cones, and Carol and Frank Gruen. This exhibit came to us through the incredible work of Caravan. Its mission is based on the belief that the arts can be one of the most effective mediums to heal our world and to creatively foster peace, harmony, wholeness, and health in all its forms. Caravan originated out of an artistic bridge building initiative in Cairo, Egypt in 2009 that focused on addressing the then growing chasm of discord and misunderstanding between the peoples, cultures, and creeds of the Middle East and the West. The nomadic caravan theme comes out of the founding vision to encourage and facilitate those from diverse backgrounds and worldviews to journey together through the arts. While Caravan's mission is global in focus, they maintain an ongoing program emphasis on the Middle East due to their founding. We invite you to visit oncaravan.org to learn more about the organization. The Multifaith Council is a membership organization comprised of a network of allied communities of faith that sustain and expand IAM's interfaith relations and community partnerships efforts to engage faith leaders in dialogue, collaboration, and respect. The council is made up of members who want to be bridge builders by building respect and understanding, to support the work of IAM's interfaith relations and community partnerships department, and to be a resource when we seek support to respond to community needs. This event, was especially designed for multi-faith council members, and we welcome community members from the three faiths represented in the exhibit to share their reflections. We welcome the Reverend Danny Yang, Westbury United Methodist Church, Rabbi Samantha Safran, the Evelyn Rubenstein Jewish Community Center, and Dr. Kawaja Azimuddin from the Islamic Art Society. Let's join Kim Mabry, Program Manager, as she introduces the event. One, many a beautiful exhibit that features artwork from three talented artists about living harmoniously in today's world. The exhibit is the brainchild of the Right Reverend Paul Gordon Chandler, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Wyoming. This traveling exhibition was supposed to take place as an in-person exhibit last May against the backdrop of the Bridget and Bashar Kalai Plaza of Respect at the Interfaith Ministries building. But COVID-19 changed our plans as it has many of yours. The exhibit halted its international journey in February of 2020 and all subsequent host sites canceled or postponed their events. We here at IM are the first site to reschedule and choose to host it as a virtual exhibit. While an in-person experience has many advantages, 
we have found that this virtual experience offers creative opportunities and rich experiences as well. And we think that today's program promises to be just that, and we hope that you feel the same. During April and May, this exhibit will unite people in learning, dialogue, and art appreciation through programming planned by Interfaith Relations and Community Partnerships Department here at IM. Events such as Faith in Our City, sessions on Zoroastrianism and the Muslim traditions, a dinner dialogue, our third annual Gershenson lecture, and a special one-time only program with the three artists who will be calling in from three different places in our world. All of these events can be found on our calendar of, of events on our website. And we will put that link to our website in the chat box for you so you can register um, right after this. As we hope you are gonna join in many of those other programs and that this isn't your first or your last event with us for the Abraham exhibit. Now, while today's program will focus on just three of the 15 paintings in the exhibit, we want to make sure that you know that after today's event, you have a bonus if you can stay on and watch a 30 minute uh, tour of the entire exhibit led by my colleague, Reverend Greg Hahn. But for today's discussion, our focus will be on one of the primary and most well-known stories of Abraham's life, the sacrifice of Abraham and Sarah's child, or at least the near sacrifice as Abraham's knife never strikes the child. That is why in Hebrew, the story is called the Akedah or the binding. While the child named in the Christian and Jewish traditions is Isaac, it is important to recognize that the child is assumed to be Ishmael in Islam, reflecting the centrality of those two children and those three faith traditions. It is this story that inspires today's focused painting selection entitled Sacrificial Love. And to discuss this topic and the art that it inspired, we have faith leaders from all three traditions here with us today to discuss the impact of this most famous of Abrahamic stories. I am most grateful to have with us today, Reverend Danny Yang, who has been the senior pastor at Westbury United Methodist Church since July 2016. His first job was as a semiconductor engineer at Advanced Micro Devices before switching careers and entering the religious ministry. Next, we have Rabbi Samantha Safran. She is director of the Bobby and Vic Samuel Center for Jewish Living and Learning at the Evelyn, Evelyn Rubenstein Jewish Community Center here in Houston, where she has served for the past nine years. And we have with us Dr. Kawaja Azumadin. He is a gastrointestinal surgeon here in Houston, and he is a published author and a ceramic artist, and is also the president of the Islamic Art Society, which aims to share the rich heritage of Islamic arts. And we will have links for you to all of their organizations that they represent in the follow-up email that you'll get after today's event. Now, as we go into our discussion, I wanna encourage all of you to put any questions that you have in the, the chat box, because at the end, we'll have a short session of question and answer. And so we're happy to read those from the chat box and give those to our panelists. So keep in mind any questions and feel free to, to populate the chat box with that. But to start, we're going to begin with a question that's a, a little more personal in nature and ask our panelists, why did you say yes to this invitation? What about this topic sparked your interest? Panelists, who feels, who feels brave to jump in there? Can jump in. Okay, Kim. So uh, this is Dr. Azimuddin. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate this fantastic opportunity and thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Islamic Arts Society, which aims to share the rich heritage of Islamic arts. Um, in doing so, we actually hope to bring people together and Reverend Han has been to our many of our festivals and really it's a common sharing we call uh, people and they come and visit us and 
we open up a dialogue, we talk to each other. And the idea being that our, with arts, people let down their guards and open up freely, talk to each other. Uh, so our idea is to promote mutual respect between people of different faiths. So when I heard about uh, this program of shared ancestry and, and the art that binds us together, it was a no-brainer for me, and I jumped in. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to go next. Hi, everybody. Um, so glad to be with you this afternoon. Um, I was interested in participating first because I love interfaith ministries and my, my colleagues over there are very special to me. And so whenever we have the chance to collaborate, um, I, I, and, and I can do it, I, I am in, I am on board. Um, and especially with a program like this, uh, I have a personal love of the arts and for art in general. Uh, I, I, what I love about art, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but um, for me, art is um, a, a form of expression and is open to interpretation very much in the way that I think Jewish tradition and our Jewish heritage and Jewish stories um, have been open to interpretation by our Jewish commentators and scholars over centuries and generations. And so to me, there's a very a strong connection between um, art and Jewish tradition. And I'm always happy to talk more about that. So. Thank you. And Reverend Yang? Sure. Um, similar to what you've heard, uh, what attracted me to this is just the spirit of interfaith ministries to hear how, um, how God speaks in different traditions. Um, I'm just, in general, a very curious person. So I wanted to participate to, to learn um, in my attraction to art. I really took hold during my years at St. Paul's United Methodist Church where Kim and I worked together for a few years. Um, St. Paul's is across the street from the Museum of Fine Arts of Houston. Um, and so it is a great place to work when you need a lunch break or, or just a thinking break, <laughs> just cross the street and you're at a world-class museum. And I think, um, those years there, taking frequent breaks, crossing the street, um, art can speak the truth in ways that words can't. Um, and that's from someone who, I traffic in words, like that is like everything about words, but it is true that art does something that words can never express. Thank you. Before we dive into the paintings, I think it would be interesting to hear the three of you tell us about your own personal understanding or interpretation of the Agadah story, um, this most famous story of Abraham. Just how have you personally um, been, been touched by that story and what's your understanding? Do we go in the same order? Or sure, we'll let first? you go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Dr. Azamuddin, go ahead. Okay, okay. So growing up in a Muslim tradition and in a family, uh, we've always used to see this uh, Eid al-Adha, the festival of sacrifice, which is celebrated all over the Muslim world. And uh, it's this uh, celebrating this very sacrifice of Abraham. But uh, surprisingly, as you mentioned, you know, um, in the Muslim faith, it is uh, Ishmael, not Isaac, who Abraham took for the sacrifice. Uh, Abraham had this dream again and again. Every night he had this dream where, uh, you know, an angel came and asked him to do this command to fulfill this uh, uh, the desire from God. And Abraham was very disturbed and he didn't know what to what to do but when it kept when the dream kept repeating he was convinced that it was god who was instructing him to do this so he actually confides in our tradition he confides in uh, ishmael and ishmael says well father you are a pious man and god is not going to lead you astray he must be uh, he must be sending you a message please do so uh, so it was also Ishmael who was steadfast and obedient in following the word of God uh, or the will of God. So both father and uh, son set out on this journey where the ultimate aim was to sacrifice. So this is uh, the tradition that in our Muslim countries we celebrate 
every year and remembering this tradition. Thank you very much. And Reverend Yang, how about you? Okay. It's, there's, there's nothing easy about this story. Um, I think on one hand, anthropology, you know, anthropology, you could just say this is a rejection of human sacrifice um, because that was a practice in the ancient Near East and similar religion around then. And why we would want to even think about that is because there's a sense of wanting to show appreciation and gratitude to God. So you bring gifts and offerings. This is something um, many religious cultures do, right? Let, let me show my thanks to God. And what is the most precious thing that a parent has? Um, and so somewhere it gets, um, I don't know the right word to say, but somewhere along the line, some cultures decided, what about human sacrifice? And this story becomes a rejection of that and saying that God does not want that. Um, but I think that doesn't, that's still a hard story to hear. Um, and Another interpretation I've read before is that it's a warning about our relationship to God. Um, and so if you read the story in Genesis, um, Abraham's whole relationship with God, Abraham in the past has been very argumentative with God in a good way. So he will argue like if there's 40 good people, what about 20? What about 10? So he has conversations with God. And yet when God asks him to do this, Abraham shuts down and he doesn't argue, which is very odd. And it seems like something fractured their relationship. And if you read the account in Genesis, at least, after this episode, Abraham no longer talks to God. Um, and so that is, it's an open-ended sort of interpretation to ask what happened. But I think that helps us to consider um, what, what fractured in this episode between Abraham and God. Um, and then from the Christian tradition, um, there is a connection to Jesus and um, this idea that God um, has given God's only son on behalf of humanity. And so that links this story to the Christian faith. Thank you. And Rabbi Safran. Sure. So um, this story is, a, it's a very important story in Jewish tradition. Um, we read this story every year on the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. Um, and there have been so many commentaries um, over the generations, uh, as, as I mentioned before, and just Jewish tradition does this in general, but particularly with this story, um, the, our ancient rabbis and sages and scholars really um, tore this story apart, and there are so many different um, interpretations, too many uh, to go into here. Um, I would say that um, some of them do kind of offer different explanations for what happened. Some say that the angels um, intervened and melted Abraham's knife and he didn't have it anymore. Some say that, um, that uh, because Abraham was silent in this story, um, later on he said to God, well, because I was silent for this, you need to help out my future generations and please protect them and argue for them in a way that, you know, I kept silent for you. So now you kind of owe me. So that's, um, Reverend Yang, you're, you're talking about, right, talking back to God. So, um, but uh, for me, um, I have to admit that it's, I struggle with this story um, and it's hard for me to find um, meaning in it unless I look at it as though um, Abraham was testing God. And that's, that's kind of my interpretation of it um, and and there have been a couple of modern commentators who um, who have also written a little bit about this but um, the way that I can understand it is that for Abraham what kind of God would ask someone to do something like this God must not mean it so maybe God wasn't thinking straight <laughs> maybe God went a little bit too far and we know that Abraham is good at kind of keeping God in check and so maybe this was, um, you know, Abraham thought to himself, well, okay, I'm going to see if God really, really means this. And I don't think that Abraham ever intended to sacrifice his son, but wanted to see how far he would get before God or the angels or whomever um, 
intervened. And, and that's kind of, that's a way that I can read this story and still have it um, have value because also in Jewish tradition, I, I, I think it's very much a part of our tradition to challenge God and, and grapple with God and argue with God. Um, and so I, I think it's okay to say that um, maybe sometimes we test God just like God tests us. That's beautiful. Thank you for both the traditional and then your personal interpretation, all of you. Thank you. For the sake of time, we're going to go right into the paintings. Um, and so Greg, yes, thank you. So Greg has become an expert at our virtual gallery. So he's going to take us to our three paintings of sacrificial love. While he's getting us there, um, the first painting that we're going to start with is from the Christian tradition, from the Christian art artist Kai Al Sindi. And we're going to look at this interpretation of the story. And we're going to start with each painting that we go to, we're going to start with that uh, faith leader who represents that artist tradition. So, Reverend Yang, start us out with answering the question share how you see each of these paintings and what and how each artist conveys the idea of sacrificial love. How does this speak that message of sacrificial love to you? Sure. Um, so with this painting, I will share, um, you know, sitting and dwelling and looking on this. Um, first, I'm very nearsighted. <laughs> so if you're here in person, you can see uh, how thick my glasses are, which was helpful in this case um, because the, the artist here paints in blocks of color. And, um, and if you sort of blur your vision, it's almost like a Rothko, Barnett, Newman mashed together. Um, and when you see it, then it becomes a very vertical painting too. It draws, it draws your eyes up and down. And so just looking at it, you know, briefly, you're entered into this relationship, this, this question of how do we relate to God? Um, and then if you just kind of look at the colors, um, on the computer screen, at least, which is how we're interacting with it now, um, I noticed the brightness of Abraham's beard. Um, and that's the color that really pops out in this painting. And when I look at the, the white long beard, it reminds us of Abraham's age and, um, and all that he's lived and all that he's experienced, but also reminds us of how long he waited uh, for the birth of his child and the promise that he would have a child and just waiting and waiting and wondering if it would happen. And finally, um, Sarah and Abraham received their child. And then to be asked this um, impossible command. Uh, and so I think those colors just kind of come out. Um, but then this moment is also really ambiguous that the artist chose to paint this moment. Um, when in the story does this occur? And I think that that the artist didn't share in, in the um, description, um, is this before placing the child on the altar or after? Um, and then when you look at this, there's a question, um, the artist did share that he, he couldn't paint Abraham's eyes. He didn't know how to do that. And so that's why uh, the screen is not cut off. Uh, it was intentional to, to not know how to paint that expression. Yet the child's eyes are there and looking at this painting, you have to ask, is the child alive? Um, and when you begin to look at it more, then what I noticed is this is, in many ways, this is a Pieta painting. So if you can remember, um, Michelangelo is probably the most famous. There's a sculpture in um, St. Peter's Church where Mary, the mother of Jesus, is holding Jesus's dead body. And this same pose is, it's almost, you can see that same pose. Um, and so that sort of connects this with a, a tradition in Western art of the Pieta, um, but also weaves that thread together with um, how this story reflects God's relationship with Jesus and to us. Um, and I appreciate in the artist's comments that he paints the palm tree in the corner, and that's sort of a, a symbol of the promise, but that palm tree is far overshadowed by Abraham's act of obedience. Um, and I think this moment is, it's a good, I don't know, because that's right, it's a, it's a profound painting because it forces us with the ambiguity, uh, not knowing when this happens, seeing the connection, but also asking who would receive such a sacrifice. 
I mean, the, what is drawn here is the moment when Abraham is offering his child as a sacrifice. And we are forced to confront who would receive such a sacrifice and to turn it upon ourselves and consider our theology and our faith. That is beautiful, uh, beautiful. Ra um, Rabbi and Dr. Azimuddin, do you have uh, any comments to that? I'm also struck with the luminance of the beard. Um, I guess white or the pure color here being, uh, you know, uh, purity depicting that and the child in his arms. Um, yeah, so very impressive. Um, Rabbi? Yeah, I would just add that a, a sort of an interesting fact, which is that uh, some of our um, Jewish writings talk about how Isaac was not a child, but rather that he was 37 years old when this happened, um, based on some of the math about um, when he was born and when Sarah died and um, when this happened. And so, you know, it's just, it changes your perception and understanding of the story when you think about a grown man of 37 versus a, a child. And clearly here, um, you know, is a depiction of a child. Um, but there is that um, thread of understanding in Jewish tradition that perhaps he was actually older. So just something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. That definitely changes the dynamics of, of the story. Um, I hope we get, I hope we touch on that a little more. Greg, let's move to the next painting. The next painting is by Jewish artist Shay Azule. And we'll let Rabbi Safran start us on this one. Okay. Um, I wished that he had written more about his thoughts about this painting, and I would love to um, join your, your program. I think you said that you're going to be speaking with the artists um, at some point, right? Because uh, I would be really curious, you know, when I first uh, looked at this, it was really hard to make a connection between the story of this sacrifice that we've been looking at and, and this uh, painting. Um, but I spent some time, you know, really trying to kind of notice things. And um, so one of the things that that the artist talked about was this circle of people and that um, in Jewish tradition, uh, circle dancing is a is a custom um, that that often brings people together. And you can see from the people who are a part of this circle that they, it looks like a, a diverse group of people, lots of colors um, in their clothing and, and, uh, and their bodies. Um, and um, circles also in Jewish tradition, they do represent a sort of healing. Um, we read how in the book of Joshua, um, they, they circled the walls of Jericho seven times before the walls came down. And that's one of the reasons why um, at a Jewish wedding, sometimes the bride will circle the groom seven times or in more modern weddings, the bride and groom circle each other. Um, but again, to, to break down, to symbolize the breaking down of walls and the breaking down of barriers. Um, and so when I look at this and I, I look at this circle that to me, represents kind of a circle of unity and, and maybe healing. And Abraham is not a part of that circle. Abraham is outside of it. And, and he's, he's standing back or, or sitting back on this magical uh, carpet and looking down, looking over this circle. And, um, you know, it was mentioned before that after this incident of the sacrifice um, or the near sacrifice, um, that Abraham was silent, um, that Abraham then does not speak to God again after that. Um, and we don't hear much about him, uh, I think because he's really traumatized by this event and, and um, he's dealing with some major PTSD um, after this happened. And what does he do? What do we hear that he does? Well, 
the one thing that we do hear about is that he goes and uh, he sends someone to find a wife for Isaac. Um, that's one of the last things that we hear about him doing before he dies. And so to me, that maybe indicates that he was trying to repair his relationship with Isaac and restore that relationship. And, and, and so um, perhaps in that way, um, similarly here in this painting, he is overseeing a, a, the healing of others and trying to tend to the healing of others, even though maybe he couldn't heal himself, um, but he's but he's trying to bring others in and, and create a, a circle of healing. And so um, that's kind of, that's what I see. Um, and maybe the, the sacrificial love for him is really just about um, giving, trying to give love to others. Again, maybe he couldn't, even when he, even though he found a wife for Isaac, maybe he couldn't repair his, you know, Isaac was too traumatized and he couldn't repair that relationship. But maybe here, um, maybe the artist is hoping that he found a way to kind of, uh, you know, bring healing to, to other people. And of course, we know that as we, we consider him a patriarch in Jewish tradition, one of the founders, uh, you know, the, the first um, person to become uh, part of the Jewish uh, people. And so um, I think in this way that that represents um, his, his um, starting being a founder of the Jewish people and, and overseeing maybe others healing if he couldn't heal himself. Thank you. Dr. Azimuddin, did you have uh, an interpretation of this or how did it strike you? I'm uh, very much attracted to this picture. Um, is, here is a group of people forming a harmonious circle. Everyone is included and you can see there are people, diverse group of people. This is a diverse group of people. So the circle is all inclusive and there is Abraham who is uh, floating on a carpet um, bringing a sense of peace, calm and serenity uh, to the group of people. Um, also, I would like to point out that uh, in this picture, Abraham, who is uh, he's depicted in an abstract form, which is more like the Islamic tradition of not depicting the prophets. Um, so I think that is important here that I kind of relate to this picture that Abraham is not shown with his uh, full form, but rather in an abstract form. So I, I love this picture. Thank you. Absolutely. Reverend Yang? I'm, I'm just learning and listening. I, mean, I, just, I think it's interesting to see the negative space. Um, so our eyes, at least my eyes are drawn to the space in the middle of the circle. And then to think about um, that Isaac is not um, portrayed in this. And so feeling, we naturally feel that negative space or think about that and make that connection. And I like what Rabbi Safran said, I'd be curious what the artist would share about um, the thinking and the decisions made. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you too, Reverend Yang, can come and join us with the artists and find out, have all your answers. Um, well, thank you very much. This is a very interesting interpretation of the story of Abraham. And now let us go to our last artist, which is Sanan Hussein, um, our Muslim artist. And we're going to start with Dr. Azimuddin. And there, this is there is a lot of very rich symbolism in this in this painting. So I look forward to your how it strikes you. Dr. Azimuddin? Yes, it's, it's a beautiful picture. And I would start off with the same thread that in, in our tradition uh, in Islam, we like not to portray figurative images of our revered personalities. Not that it has not been done, even in the Middle Ages and hundreds of years ago, there have been figurative portrayals of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and other revered uh, people. But artists usually try to shun away from that. But here is a picture where uh, Abraham depicts the, brings to us the scene of the sacrifice. Abraham is already looking up towards God, uh, one hand, black hand with a black glove, 
uh, represented or symbolizing evil is holding uh, Ishmael. And the other hand with the red glove, meaning bloodshed, evil, uh, with knife uh, right there on the neck of Ishmael, uh, it's ready to happen. And uh, then there is a lot of other symbolism here. And um, uh, you can see that God has um, replaced uh, the sacrificial uh, animal as a lamb and or a ram uh, who's right there. And um, yeah, uh, then those heavenly figures on top that you see, they are trying to console uh, Abraham and Ishmael uh, that, uh, you know, okay, this is happening, be steadfast. And uh, another thing that I really notice is that uh, Ishmael is sitting cross-legged and not in a pose that he's trying to run away or uh, escape from this torment. Uh, he's all obedient and, uh, you know, given in to the will of God. So I think it is not just uh, Abraham, but also Ishmael who are equally being obedient uh, to God. Uh, you also see a cone there on which uh, Ishmael is sitting. And the cone, this artist, this particular artist uses uh, to depict a sacred moment. And of course, this is a moment that is as sacred as it can get. Um, so in all, I think a, there is a beautiful rendition of sacrificial love in this painting. Uh, sacrifice for the great other, which is the God. Um, and, and then all others, which was the spirit of Abraham, is to sacrifice one owns self, one owns need, one owns, uh, you know, uh, stuff for, for somebody else. And that is what, you know, the message is here, is that we need to be willing to give up or sacrifice what we love most for the sake of others and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the great other, which is who is God. Right, we have a question in the chat box about what are your feelings of the significance of the man with the horns? Uh, man in the horns, okay, so that's, you can take it uh, many different ways. You see the man in the horns, um, face is not visible, and he is actually trying to hold back Abraham's black hand holding Ishmael. So he's kind of preventing um, Abraham from committing this act of sacrifice. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, some would say that this is uh, a good thing that uh, he's trying to prevent bloodshed uh, and prevent Abraham from sacrificing his, his only child. On the other hand, you might also say this, this is the Satan because he's trying to prevent Abraham from carrying out the will of God. So if God tells uh, Abraham and Abraham is all willing and somebody is trying to get in between there, so I think that is, uh, that is a very negative uh, connotation here that this, uh, this could be the devil himself. That is my understanding. Very good. Um, Rabbi Safran, what are, what are your thoughts on this painting? It's quite different than the one from your artist. Yes, very different. I think it's a beautiful imagery, but I, uh, uh, and I love what was already said about it, but I really, I don't have too much to say about this one still just kind of taking it in. <laughs> yes, and more comes out at you the longer you stare. Yeah. Like the clouds just kind of, it's almost yeah. like they're still in formation. Very much so. Um, Reverend Yang. They're parting there where the sunlight is coming yes. through. So uh, yes. that's kind of the pure light or the light of God coming through. Yes, yeah, someone mentioned in the chat that it, it really just is focused shining directly on Ishmael. So that, that light of God is right there with him. Reverend Yang, what are your thoughts? Uh, um, I appreciate this event because I'm thinking about how Rabbi Safran brought up um, that in other stories, Ishmael is a grown man. And yes. this, this is depicted here. And 
it adds, um, it gives agency to, to Ishmael in the story, um, which in other stories is missing. I mean, how, that, that is such an interesting um, difference between the Christian rendition and the Muslim artist that, that what, what, what difference does that make that it's a grown man versus a small, a small child? Like what significance does that have? We, this, this particular, um, you know, th this particular exhibit is about the ideas of peace, justice, and healing. And maybe this is a good segue into that, that next question that we have for actually all three paintings. Greg, if you could kind of shift into so that we can see all three paintings, that how do these paintings inspire peace, justice, and healing, especially with those two? One is perhaps a child and the other a grown man. What does this, how do these three speak to that? Um, I'll go, uh, Danny, you're on camera. Can I pick on you first? Sure. <laughs> um, I think it's, I would say that was a difficult question to dwell on. Um, I, when I think about this story, I don't usually think about peace justice. Um, but I, I, looking at the, the Christian painting, um, he, the artist does not pull back from the tension of the story. I think he, he steps into it presents it in um, in many ways the most uncomfortable way um, and I think when we are confronted with troubles uh, we tend as humans to want to um, absolve that tension any way we can mm -hmm. um, and so we don't like living with tension or dissonance and I think that invites us to reflect on why this story troubles us and to seek some resolution, some peace to find. Um, how do we move to a place where um, at least we understand what is going on with our spirit, with our relationship with God, how this points us to our relationship with one another. Um, so I think that kind of creates something and unsettles us and that, that movement can um, push us towards action. Very good. Rabbi Safran, how about this question for you? Your, your, painting, your painting alludes a lot to this idea of peace, justice, and healing. Yes, for sure. I mean, I, I, I uh, think I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but just in talking and thinking about um, the trauma that um, Abraham and Isaac uh, both went through in this story. And then, you know, looking at this painting, uh, although we've, how we've discussed how Isaac is not, to our knowledge, represented here, um, but perhaps Abraham trying to facilitate some sort of healing or unity or understanding among a diverse group of people, um, perhaps as a reaction to what he just went through, perhaps to come help him come to terms with what he just um, went through. Um, so, you know, I think that's one for sure with this painting. Um, I think there is very much here about um, unity and and understanding. Um, speaking of understanding, it's interesting. There's also, there's another um, midrash, another story that the rabbis uh, wrote about like a commentary on this story saying that the entire thing was a big misunderstanding and that God never asked um, Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. God only asked Abraham to bring Isaac up. There's kind of a play on this, on the word, the Hebrew word. And um, that perhaps, you know, that was never the intention to begin with. So you think just thinking about, you know, intentions and misunderstandings and and um, trauma and post-trauma, um, you know, there's lots of so many different ways to take this story. Um, but certainly, the painting I think could be Abraham's coming to terms with his own trauma um, by facilitating the healing of others. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, Dr. Azamuddin, how about your painting in regards to how it portrays? peace, justice, or healing? Um, the peace uh, part, I see that uh, the figures um, in the sky, they are all uh, uttering good words or comforting or solace, words of solace to Abraham and Ishmael, uh, trying to 
give provide them some peace. Uh, it also shows that there is a ram that is being replaced, and that shows the justice of God. God is not cruel. He is, uh, you know, he, he is just, and he would not want uh, Abraham to really sacrifice his son. So he portrays, uh, he brings this, um, the ram instead of the son. And I actually would just allude also that I saw a question in the chat, what is the face on the ram's body? And the face is that of Ishmael. Uh, so if you look at it a little closely, right in the smack center, there is a face there and uh, of the, on the ram. And that is uh, the artist is portraying Ishmael here. Yes, right there. Uh, so the Ishmael is being replaced by the ram. Um, basically, in, in this entire picture, what comes out is the whole story, the story of sacrifice. Uh, willingness to sacrifice your most loved position uh, is the key to creating cultures of peace, harmony, and justice. And I think that is the whole essence of this entire story that is being broadcast here, that uh, you must be able to sacrifice deeply for what you love most um, and uh, give up your own stuff for others. Uh, and that would simply bring uh, peace and justice uh, to the world. I want to give each of you a chance to you each commented on your own painting, but I just wanted to make sure that you all had an opportunity. If there was something you'd like to say about peace, um, peace, love, and justice that came across in paintings from the other artists that you didn't comment on. Do, you, do each of you see anything in the other artists that perhaps might speak to you more than maybe the artist of your own tradition? I think the painting from the Jewish artist, uh, once again, you know, it really uh, such a harmonious, uh, peaceful circle, people are coming together. Uh, you know, this is the pa painting from Shaya Zoli. Uh, it just uh, looks very serene to me. It strikes yes. a chord with me. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, Rabbi or Reverend Yang, did you have anything more you wanted to add? We can go on to the next question, if not. All right, well, so the next question, and Greg, we can go ahead and keep the paintings um, pan paintings up. I wanted to ask you about this difference between religious and secular art. And how do you think that paintings such as those that we're looking at that are rooted in a biblical story, how does that affect us differently, a religious, religious art versus secular art? And Dr. Azimuddin, I have you on the screen, so I can go with you first. Okay, um, you know, um, my interest is uh, Islamic art, which is obviously religious art. And, um, um, you know, of course, uh, I'm no um, authority on different types of arts or, sec or even secular art. But of course, you know, it, it strikes a chord in me. Uh, it's... Uh, it's a continuous circle um, um, journey in the same uh, in the same medium. Uh, basically, I love. Uh, I may digress a little, but I tell you that uh, for me, um, Islamic arts, which is what I love and what I do, um, is all about depiction of peace, tranquility, and beauty. Uh, it is reflective of the of a better world. You, maybe you take calligraphy, maybe you take, uh, you know, Arabes. All these are deeply rooted in the oneness of God. And uh, even on superficially, it may not seem like it is religious to you, like an Arabes pattern or a geometric pattern. It may not seem religious to you, but there is a deep underneath, uh, a deep uh, meaning behind this. For example, arabesque means that, or geometric art means it's a never unending, un, uh, undivided uh, continuum or infinity 
uh, event, which is the oneness of God. So I think uh, in that sense, every art that I see, I, I'm trying to find an area where I can find a religious connotation in it. Uh, so that's my bias. Reverend Yang. Um, I think this was a, it was an interesting question for me. Uh, so I'll share, originally when we were planning this, one of the questions was um, share a, a piece of art that is meaningful and significant to you. And um, what came to my mind was actually the Rothko Chapel in Houston. Um, and and I, I love that space. Um, but if you know a little bit of Rothko's history, he's, he, he's an atheist. Um, he, he drew a spiritual sacred space without reference to any religious story. Um, but I think art that is sacred uh, reminds us that there's more than just our corporal sense. Like we are more than just meat, uh, if I wanna say it that way. Um, and when we're reminded we're more than just, you know, trying to pass on our genetics or anything like that, then we ask, how are we connected together? What is the bond that, that um, that is beyond just our, our bodily selves. And that's what art can do, um, at least for me. And then if it is religious, if it has a reference to a religious story, then that begins to answer that question by tying us into a grander narrative, um, something that God's spirit is moving through the world and how we are latched into that story. Um, and so that's where religious art can add a, a, a layer beyond what secular art can do. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and Rabbi Safran. Yeah, so I very much agree with um, with what's been said. I, I think that um, art itself is, is an expression. It's an expression of self, it's an expression of the artist, and it's an expression of the artist's understanding of the world. Um, and religious art then, um, I think, can also kind of help us look at the world and understand something greater than ourselves. Um, and, and to me, um, just as in Jewish tradition, we have so many um, commentaries and uh, commentaries on the commentaries and, you know, like just it's endless. Um, to me, painting, paintings and art is just another form of text. It's a way that we understand our tradition, a way that we interpret our tradition and a way that we find meaning in our tradition. Um, and so um, I think that, you know, religious art specifically, I mean, religion, I think all religions at the end of the day are trying to find a way to understand the world and make it better and, and make us our best selves. I think ideally that's what religion is. And, um, and so I, you know, I think religious art is an extension of that. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any, I don't see any questions from the audience. Greg, did I miss any? Sorry, when I'm sharing, it takes me a second to find my mute button. Uh, no, okay. but a lot, um, I think the significance of the horns, the light of God, the meaning on the face, the side of the ram. Um, interesting, again, a lot of comments particularly towards the the piece by Hussein um uh, it's it's got the most going on as many people right you know recognized um with uh I think that someone used the word chaotic uh and I would think that this would have been quite a chaotic event as well so um Absolutely. but yeah there was there's definitely a lot going on within uh, within this painting. And that's where most of the commentary is. It's not to discount, um, again, I think the more subtle nature of these two, but they're uh, deeply rich and just takes a different kind of eye or to kind of attune your eye in a slightly different way, I think, to see what's in here, which is, I think, another important um, skill that 
I think visual arts teach is mm-hmm. attuning the eye in different ways to see and to pay attention to what you're not seeing as well. I think Danny's comment on the use of negative space, and I put a comment about my favorite. If you ever see the FedEx truck go by, look for the arrow made by the negative space in the center of the logo. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, and I encourage everybody to you know stay on if you can and look at the full exhibit and you'll see just this thread between each of our artists and the five themes that the curator has put together for us. Um, I will go ahead and this closes our episode, our, our event for now, but I just want to thank all of our, um, our participants here and wanted you to know that we are just so happy that you're here. Um, and I'm going to let Greg go ahead and take us on into our, our next showing. So Super. if you, yes. I would just again say thank you for coming. Um, uh, just a special thanks as well to our three, uh, you know, faith representatives for their time. So if you'll join me in a round of thanks, um, and uh, we will um, just as also a continued reminder. Again, thank you to all of our sponsors, to all of our donors who have made this exhibit possible, and um, um, sorry and that there's a plenty of opportunities to see other the, to see this this exhibit in a variety of other ways um, including our faith in our city coming up in uh, in May, which will focus on the Islam uh, on the Muslim tradition, and Dr. Azimuddin, and um, a representative from the Islamic Art Society, will be joining us to talk a little bit more about art in the Muslim tradition. Um, we have our Gershenson lecture, where I will be the lecturer uh, on that will close the event on May twentieth. We have our dinner dialogue coming up on May thirteenth, which will be very I'm really excited about because we'll have representatives from the Hindu and the Buddhist traditions to talk about art in those cases. And you'll have more time to break into virtual, into breakout rooms to, um, uh, to talk with one another. But please visit imgh.org, uh, click the events button in the upper right-hand corner and sign up to your heart's content. So I'll leave it there. Do you have anything else, Kim, before I turn us around and uh, begin the tour of the whole, um, of the whole exhibit? No, I just want to, again, thank you to our panelists, Reverend Yang, Rabbi Safran, and Dr. Azamuddin, and just thank you for your time and energy that you gave to prepare for this event. Our community is stronger because of the strength of shared beliefs and people like you who dedicate your time to events such as this. And Greg, thank you for being my backup and tech support. And of course, to our Vice President, Jody Bernstein, for just supporting our efforts um, and these events that are, are part of our Abraham exhibit out of one many.